But generally, everything you do, every thought you have, every decisions you make, they're all in your brain. That's where the CPU is. So now we're trying to get access to that and predict them and be able to change them. That's the outcome. So the reality is that the way we do that is by finding ways to look at your brain first. We put a device on the scalp that has a very sensitive electrode that can listen to the inside of your brain. And then we start showing you pictures. That's one example of maybe a bad words and good words. Words like love, optimism, success, a desire, and bad words would be failure, disappointment, disgusting, and so on. And we look at your brain with those devices and immediately we see that every time we show you a nice word, this part lights up. Every time we show you a bad word, this part lights up. Simplifying. It's not as simple, but let's make it as simple as it gets. This part, we say codes good thing. This part codes bad things. Now that we fix that, we can take a new thing, like a brand, and show you a picture of Chanel, a picture of Louis Vuitton, a picture of Ferrari. And we see which of the two parts light up, left or right. If the left lights up, we say, okay, it seems like this part makes you think the same way it happened when you saw nice things. And that part makes you so on. So this is a simple example, just to, to idealize how we first learn about your brain, and then we learn how you respond to brands. And you can replace now brands by experiences or by services. And the point is that we can first learn how you code and then predict things. We can do more than that. We can uh, look at parts of your brain that uh, code personalities. So you have a friend that you really like and your liking this friend is manifested by this part lighting up. And then we show you a brand and we see that you respond by the same area and we say, okay, it's not that just like him, but you like him the same way you like a friend. Whereas this friend you like like a project or like an item. So we can now separate how you think about those in terms of like, do you like them and do you see them as a friend or a person or an object? Do you see, let's take a, a, a ring by a famous company, Tiffany. Do you see it like an item or do you see it like an experience, like something that will be, make you better? So we can start zooming in on how you think about that. That's all ways to interpret your feelings towards things. And the important thing here is we don't ask you a single question. We ask your brain. So if I ask you, you will give me an answer. You might say, I think that I like it or not, but we don't care. We don't care what you say, we care what your brain, what your brain says. And it's because we can show that what your brain tells me is much more predictive of things you're going to do later than what you say. You might say, I'm definitely going to buy this. And then you won't because suddenly you won't have the money or suddenly uh, two other things are going to come up and you actually will move something else. We can know that early on by just looking at your brain when you say, I'm going to definitely buy that. And no, no, he won't. Let's not invest time in this customer, but in that customer who actually will. And that they give you answers always and that the brain can tell you different things. And so it's important not just to get data, but also to get data that is meaningful. And it turns out that people answering questions is not the most meaningful way. People behaving is much more meaningful. Like if you ask them what they will do and compare it to what they actually do, the what they actually do is much more meaningful than what they say they will do. And the brain is another data source that people should use. When you walk in the supermarket, in the aisle, there are tons of products. Your eyes can go anywhere. There's just too many things to see. And the question is, A, what gets seen? And B, what gets remembered? And a lot of times, people spend a lot of energy trying to predict that, and they even try to manipulate it. Like the, the customers in the, the supermarket are trying to sort things so people will see them. They put things in the high shelf and people pay more money to be in the top shelf than the bottom shelf. And they think about what would be the right color of the package so people can see it more and so on. But what happens in the real world is that then they launch it and they see what happens. And the brain can tell you before you launch something about what's gonna happen. So what we do with eye tracking, for instance, is we just look at what draws your attention. And we know that what draws your attention isn't just driven by the color of things per se, but also by the contrast of other things, uh, by many parameters that the brain cares about. So we can look at your brain and we can say, this color is work, gonna work on that and this color won't. This color will work best if it's next to that color. So if you're uh, offering a product next to other products, here's what you should do to stand out. Purely from a biological perspective, purely from looking at your brain and knowing that your brain loves anomalies. And if I make it a little bit different, your brain's gonna capture that. And the bottom, bottom line of this story is that if you see something 
you may or may not buy it. We don't know. But if you don't see it, you surely will not buy it. So if you don't know that there's a product on the right and you have not seen it, there's no chance you're gonna buy it. The fact that you see something increases the chances of you actually considering it. And we wanna help brand at least be on the consideration set. And that is something that we can do very, very accurately. You can give me a product and I can tell you a lot of things that you can do to it so it will be seen. Now we can actually look at your brain, we can learn what are the parameters that make a decision and also how they kind of weigh. And now we can, as a business person, learn that all of our customers value this but not that and start changing the product to align with that. We can start uh, designing things that in mind. We can see there's touch points where people actually don't do what we want and change things to make them want that. So we see that maybe a lot of people, uh, they want to know the price early on rather than later on. So we can actually create different websites for that. Uh, we can segment the brands based on that. We can see that actually maybe half the customers like it this way and half like it that way. And we can align realities based on them. So we, you just come to the place, we scan your brain for two minutes and we know who you are and we create an entire experience that's gonna make you buy and so enjoy it more. So it's not like about like manipulating you and making you buy things you don't need. We'll actually learn what you want and give it to you. Is that Science is offering us very many ways to change behaviors that are risky in that they're so powerful. We can change people's genetics and make you behave differently by a small pill that you take. We can inject a virus into you that makes you think differently. One of my interests and in recent works is about we can change your thinking when you sleep. And this is creepy. This is a moment where your guards are down, you think that your brain is shut down, but it's not. It's listening and it's interpreting things and it changes. And we can make you go to sleep and wake up different. Small differences, but still different. So we can make you go to sleep as smokers and wake up not smoking. That's a positive outcome. We can make you uh, go to sleep and when you wake up, you want to eat healthier food because we change something that makes you choose the healthy option. We can make you less racist. We can make you a more optimist. We can do a lot of good things. But the point is we can do things to you. And the fact that we're looking at the nice ones is just a choice. And we don't know if there's a limit to that. We didn't try all of those things. So it's really new enough that there's a lot of exploration there. But my job is to alert the world about this before it becomes an option so we can decide together. In the US, that's a place I know well recently, uh, there's about 40,000 people right now who already have a chip inside their brain. Someone opened their brain and put the device inside. They have that because they have a clinical problem that required this operation to fix the problem. It could be depression, it could be a Parkinson's disease, where you have tremors and this chip actually fights them in your brain. So they have something in their brain. This is a digital device inside their head that does something. It also listens to the outside world because it needs to be upgraded every now and then. So it pings the outside world and asks, do you have updates for me? And when the outside world says yes, it loads the update. So it actually takes information from the outside world and puts it in the brain. And this thing actually interacts with your brain. Up to now, those devices were limited for whatever they were made for, but it's a software. And as we know from the world of hacking, software is software. Your game might have been made to do one thing, but I put a virus there and now it does totally different things. This could be now done in the brain. And this is only with people who put something there for clinical purposes. The reality is that right now there's more and more people who actually want a chip inside their brain for purposes that are not clinical. Silicon Valley is full of people who say, I want to download my memories and I want to have uh, superpowers in terms of thinking. So I want instead of a, a phone that does calculations for me, I want a phone in my head. So I will just think how much is 11 times 47 and the answer will come to me. And if you start plugging devices into the brain and letting them read software, the sky is the limit of what you can do. So everything that we can do in the real world, everything that your phone can do, your chip can do. Mathematics, high frequency trading, you can trade stocks faster, uh, learning languages, having infinite memory, everything that you can do with a device is now gonna be in your brain. Wikipedia, you wanna know when the French Revolution happened, you just think a thought, it launches a question to Wikipedia, the answer comes and you just suddenly know the answer. The uniqueness of that and the marvel is that it makes, the, makes us superhumans. We now have access to the entire internet in our mind in rapid speed. The bad side is that if someone can hack into machines, they can also hack into our brain now. And we're not equipped yet 
in dealing with thoughts that are not ours in our own brain. We don't know what to make of that. When, when I, you ask me how much is 11 and 47, and I say it's 545 and it's not two, you don't know what to do with it. Like you always think that what your brain tells you is reality. Like if you see a person, they must be there. There's no chance that you see someone and it's your brain playing tricks on you. Now this becomes a possibility that your brain can actually create things that are not real. That's risky. And I think that people are going to have to decide what they want. The power that comes with that, with the risks or none. The reason it's not in our life right now, there are many small reasons, but the main one is that the way to get into your brain requires a brain surgery. So you have to find a surgeon who agree to open your brain and put a chip inside. They don't exist. It's illegal to do it right now, at least in the Western world, unless you have a clinical problem. So the 40,000 people who have that are people who had a problem and they require the surgery. So this is the blockage. It's not technical. It's legal, it's ethical, it's something else. So a lot of people in science and business worlds are joining hands in trying to find ways to kind of go overcome this thing. So, so Elon Musk is famously trying to basically find a way to create a uh, pill that you can take and will assemble the chip inside your head so you don't have to drill a hole. If he succeeds, then suddenly there's going to be a market for this thing. So the problem is not a problem of that whether we can or cannot do that, it's whether we should or should not do that.